A very warm good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to the one day webinar on IPR prospects in the world of entrepreneurship organized by St. Gibbs College of Applied Sciences, Patam. We are excited to have you all here today to explore together the ever fascinating world of intellectual property rights. Let's begin today's program by seeking the blessings of the Almighty. Kindly observe a silent prayer. Thank you. I now request Engineer Punus George, Executive Chairman and Secretary, St. Gitt's Group of Institutions, to deliver the welcome speech. Uh, good afternoon, respected uh, Chief Guest of the Day of this uh, seminar. Dr. Rajiv and uh, the principal, Dr. K.K. John, the faculty members, as well as the students of St. Gitt's College of Applied Sciences. We are very much uh, lucky to have uh, been able to arrange such a program such a webinar on the intellectual property rights and the entrepreneurship prospects today. It is all the more good that we are having one of the foremost persons in this field. Who is uh, in IAM, one of the leaders in this field for gracing this occasion with us. Intellectual property, uh, even though it has been there from long time of the human development and the societal innovations, it is more relevant in the last century onwards especially because of the prospect of changing it into uh, valuable uh, as a valuable resource as a wealth see intellectual property is becoming intellectual property only because of the the hard work and uh, research or consistent pursuit of a problem which uh, makes out a solution which is a viable and uh, a workable solution for a genuine need that will become an intellectual property which is acceptable and which can be scaled to uh, practical use so ip rights have been established by laws of our country as well as throughout the world in almost every field. IP law itself has taken a lot of strides in, uh, in promoting especially products which are intangible like software, like uh, writings and all the things which add value to a particular uh, activity. So in this regard, we are very much happy that we could arrange such a program and uh, we have one of the best persons as the chief guest to deliver the keynote address today. On behalf of the management, 
as well as the faculty members and students of St. Gitts College of Engineering. I would like to heartily welcome Professor Rajiv Srinivasan to this webinar. Thank you, sir. We have our principal, Dr. K.K. John, an eminent economist who has many years of scholarship behind him. And it was his idea that we have to sow the seeds of thought, the seeds of intelligent discussion and uh, in the students as well as faculty minds. And it, that is the main reason for this program. I would like to welcome and congratulate principal for this initiative. There are many faculty members and students who are joining in this program. I would like to welcome all of you. And I wish this program all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I welcome Dr. Engineer Punil George, Executive Chairman of St. Gitts Group of Professional Institutions, esteemed resource person, Professor Rajiv Srinivasan, Associate Professor, Professor MC Joseph, my faculty colleagues, Dear students of St. Gitts College and nearby colleges, good afternoon, everybody. So it is a pleasant day as far as St. Gitts College of Applied Sciences is concerned. Professor Rajiv Srinivasan, a resource person of international recognition, has kindly consented to speak to us on a very vibrant subject through online platform. Let me introduce Professor Rajiv Srinivasan to the audience. He was born in Trivandrum and his schooling and pre-degree education in the capital city of Kerala. Thereafter, he moved to IIT Madras for his engineering education. As Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan has pointed out yesterday, enterprising students move out of Kerala to Madras, then to United States of America for higher education. Professor Rajiv Srinivasan took his postgraduate degree program in management from Stanford Business School in the west coast of USA, namely California. This prestigious business school was founded by the former president of USA, namely Herbert Hoover in 1925. Thereafter, he worked in the Silicon Valley for more than two decades in engineering and management. Professor Rajiv was responsible for Unix product management for Sun Microsystems and introduced Java into India. As a technocrat and management expert, he returned to India to, the, to serve the motherland. He was a member of the six-member committee to frame the intellectual property rights policy of the government of India in May 2016. To the information of the participants, let me inform you that this IPR policy has been adopted in India as part of the requirement of the Doha Development Agenda and the trade-related intellectual property rights. As our executive chairman has rightly pointed out in his inaugural address, we had a lot of laws in the country regarding IPR, like the Indian Patent Act of 1970, the Trademark Act of 1999, the Copyright Act of 1957, and the Biological Diversity Act of 2002. So the idea behind the intellectual property right of 2016 was Creative India and Innovative India. Professor Rajiv Srinivasan had opportunities to introduce innovations in more than a dozen IIMs in India, including the prestigious IIM Ahmedabad, Calcutta, and IIM Bangalore. To the information of my participants, let me inform you that 
Pandit Nehru was the man behind the introduction of IITs and IAMs. During the second five-year plan of 1956, he laid down the industrial policy of the industrialization of the country, and we wanted technocrats and management experts. With this objective in mind, he established a number of IITs and IAMs in India. Of course, it was funded by the PL480 program of the United States of America. Now, currently, Rajiv Srinivasan is a professor in IAM Bangalore and an economic advisor to Netflix, an innovation based UNESCO affiliate in Paris. I am extremely happy to welcome and introduce Professor Rajiv Srinivasan to the entire audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Professor M. C. Joseph, Associate Director, Tengiz College of Applied Sciences, will now deliver the felicitation speech. Respected Professor Rajiv Srinivasan, Professor of IAM Bangalore, Sengit's Executive Chairman, Engineer Punus George, Dr. K.K. John, Principal, Sengit's College of Applied Sciences, Assistant Professor Anish P. Baskaran, HOD Commerce, IQC Coordinator, Assistant Professor Anu Sakriya, esteemed faculty members, good students, and dear participants. Good afternoon to all of you. I feel proud to participate in the webinar organized by the Department of Commerce, St. Gitts College of Applied Sciences, and IQC being of the college. I salute Professor Rajiv Srinivasan for agreeing to participate in this webinar to share his expertise and experience with us. Intellectual property rights are given to persons over the creation of their minds. IPR is important because of legal protection is inevitable for the to foster innovation and to reap all benefits available to the business. Yenda Bhutti, Yenda Sota Adan IPR. IPR is not a new concept. It is believed that IPR was started in North Italy during Renaissance's era. Paris Convention 1883 and Bernay Convention 1886 constituted the base of IPR. The Uruguay Convention of 1994, organized by World Trade Organization, and the consequent enactment of trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights that strips control and regulate IPR. Copyrights, geographical indicators, patents, trademarks, confidential information, etc. included in IPR. 26 items from Kerala has received a geographical indication. Some of them are Aramola Kannadi, Palakkad and Matta Ari, Malabar Kurumolaka, Vadakulam Kaida Chaka. 301 products from India has received geographical indication. Some of them are Benaras Sari, Mysore Chandana Soap, Tirupadi Ledu, Chetinad Potter. I have narrated this to create interest in participants about the topic. I wish today's webinar all success. I salute all the participants, the source person, the organizers, and send its management. With this, I cut short. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will now begin the technical session by Professor Rajiv Srinivasan. On behalf of all gathered, I welcome you, sir. Thank you, Madam. I hope I'm audible. And uh, thank you very much to Engineer Panuz George, yes, and are. Dr. K.K. John, and Professor N.C. Joseph, who have, in fact, uh, in, uh, in your introductory words, you have laid out a number of the things that I would like to expand on. So I want to thank you for your warm welcome and for giving me this opportunity to speak to a number of your students. And I hope that we'll have a uh, an interesting session for the next 45 minutes. And um, Anu, is it? You're the person who's running the show, right, Anu? Right, okay. Anyway, I'm going to start. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm going to yes. start this presentation. I hope it works okay, because I'm usually on Zoom. This is the first time I've tried to do something on 
Google Meet. So I'm going to start my presentation. If it doesn't work, then I, I might need your help. Okay. So I'm just going to start uh, my okay, entire okay. screen. Okay. Let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, that didn't work. Present now. I'll just look at a window. A window. Let's see. Aha. Got it. Okay. So this is the window that I'd like to share. It has. Uh, is that visible? Is my screen visible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yes. Can you can see it. Great. All right. So I'm going to try and see if I can make this a uh, full screen presentation. If that doesn't work, we'll just go with this. Let's see if this works. Okay. All right. Is that visible? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. Very much. So. Great. Yes, sir. Ex yes, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, yes. great. Thanks. So, yeah, this is, as you know, what the topic is for today. And I want to uh, clarify that I'm not a full time faculty at uh, IAM Bangalore. In fact, I also teach at IAM Udaipur now as an adjunct faculty. And my topic is primarily innovation. And uh, this is my agenda for the day. So, there are two or three things I want you to take away from this presentation. One is that intellectual property, as already introduced by the distinguished speakers, is something that enables you to leverage the products of your thought process, right? You imagine something, you invent something, and then you're able to claim some monetary benefit from that. That's what IPR is all about. But there is a whole bunch of different types, and you may be mostly used to the idea that IPR patents. Yes, patents are a very large portion of uh, what we think about as intellectual property, but uh, there are at least five or six other types, and I'll briefly touch upon all of those. And then I'd like to spend a little time on how entrepreneurs can uh, use IPR. And I'll provide one or two models, business models that entrepreneurs can use in terms of leveraging IPR, because I also want to uh, lay down some of the limitations that I've seen among the entrepreneurs that I've dealt with. I was running an incubator called uh, Maker Village in uh, Cochin for a couple of years, and I encountered a lot of entrepreneurs there. And um, there were some issues that entrepreneurs were you know, uh, unable to deal with. So I'll touch upon that as well. And then also briefly talk about how IPR around the world works. So these are the three things I want you to take away, that uh, there are multiple types of IPR, how you can leverage IPR in terms of starting a company, and then finally, how IPR around the world works. Okay. Without further ado, let's just get into the body of the presentation. So there's a very simple definition of intellectual property, which is that it's, as we have described already, creations of the mind, and there are several different types of those creations. And WIPO is the World Intellectual Property Organization. So this is their definition. And I want to make a, uh, an immediate distinction between two types of intellectual property. And also, what is IPR? IPR is intellectual property rights. You know, what you create is intellectual property. And the IPR is the legal right that you're entitled to as the, as the officially recognized creator of that intellectual property. And this is important because there might be multiple people who come up with an idea and uh, somebody has to be given the credit for that. So that's what an IPR is. Now, copyright is one kind and an actually a very major kind of uh, intellectual property that relates to literary and artistic works. So, for example, if you write a novel or even if you write a blog post, you automatically have the copyright for that. And that's an interesting point I wanted to also take away that copyright is inherent in the act of creation. You don't have to do anything more. You, you write a song maybe, or you paint a picture, that copyright is immediately available to you. You don't have to do anything to assert it. However, in the all the others, the industrial property rights that I have laid down here, all the others have to be asserted by going to a competent authority and saying, hello, I've invented this, please give me the rights to use it. So that's a significant difference between the two. One is inherent and the other is something that you have to actively do and assert and claim for yourself. 
And we'll talk about these in detail, so I won't go through them right now. Why should you do IPR? Okay, in the current scenario that's out there in the world, intellectual property is the cornerstone of the success of some of the most visible and most impressive firms out there in, in the, uh, in the you know, uh, 1,000 or 500 top industrial firms in the world. They're all familiar with Apple. What is their IPR? It's indubitably their capability to design beautiful products, beautiful as well as extremely usable products. And that's been their key intellectual property. And they have thousands of patents and design patents, not only industrial patents, also design patents, which we'll talk about in a bit. Then there's other stuff that's very interesting. Since I lived in California, uh, and I actually worked for Bell Labs for some years, I have observed this. Xerox has a great uh, lab in Palo Alto, California, right next to Stanford University. It's called Xerox Park, standing for Palo Alto Research Center. These guys invented almost everything you see in your computer today. The mouse, the graphical user interface, the local area networking, the laser printer, everything was actually invented by Xerox Park. Unfortunately, Xerox was not very much in the business of computing, so they didn't really protect their intellectual property. They didn't patent it and erect big walls around it. And what happened as a result of that, Apple was able to take that intellectual property and build this gigantic business. It's a $1.6 trillion company now. And similarly, Bell Labs, where I worked, they had some government restrictions on them, which meant that they were not able to uh, insist on capturing their intellectual property. So they usually gave it away for, for free. Unix you know, was one of their great inventions. Now, similarly, Microsoft, they also got a lot of ideas from Xerox and Apple also. And there were a number of companies that they acquired and they picked up their IPR. And of course, the key IPR for many years was Windows, the source code of Windows. And again, it was a trillion dollar firm. So you can see that based on IPR, you can build extremely large, extremely profitable, long-lived businesses. Google's IPR, their biggest idea to begin with was they came up with this idea of a page ranking algorithm, right? You have multiple pages. And to figure out which page is more important than the other, they came up with an algorithm. And that was the thing that uh, really made them a big success compared to other search engine companies. And now what they're using is the data that they capture from all of us. The data has now become an interesting intellectual property. Suppose somebody collects data about you. Who does the data belong to? Well, I would say that in the fairness of uh, things, it should belong to you because it's your data, right? About uh, where you uh, where you go, where you uh, uh, browse the internet, uh, where you spend your money. That's your data. Unfortunately, in the current situation, people like Google and then the Chinese company Tencent and Alibaba and all these other people, Facebook, uh, they all capture our data. And I think there's going to be some changes over time. We will find some regulatory uh, setups that suggest that your data belongs to you and people have to actually pay you instead of just taking it from you. Huawei is a, is a rather controversial company, as you know. It turns out that a great deal of their interest for property is uh, stuff that they, they you know, to put it very bluntly, they stole from a company called Nortel, which was a Canadian um, uh, telecom company. Samsung, again. Now, if you look at these companies, these are all in the top, I don't know, 20 companies in the world, and they're all depending on interest for property. That's why one should pursue interest for property you know, as a material issue. It's also a philosophical issue. What is an IPR? It's a private right that the, guarant the government guarantees, and that's an extremely unusual thing. Normally, the government doesn't guarantee private rights. It only guarantees public rights. So for example, if there's a public sector entity, the government guarantees its rights. So this is an unusual thing. And the reason to do that is because the government and governments all over the world believe that by giving somebody the opportunity to create a monopoly, and monetize it, make a lot of money out of it, you will encourage innovation. But then they also wanted to have that innovation come back to the public after a while. So most of these IPR rights have a time limit, as we will see. It becomes public domain after a while. However, there is some research that suggests that uh, the correlation between strong IPR and innovation is not as much as you might think. There is some. But even in areas where there's not that much IPR, 
regimen or uh, regulations, there is a lot of innovation. And you may have heard of Linux, open source, right? Uh, that whole thing, Apache, Linux, etc. That is also, you know, uh, an alternative where people are building IPR for the public good and just putting it out in uh, the public domain. And incidentally, it's very close to what happened in India in uh, centuries past where you had all these guys who were creating intellectual property and they would just put it in the public domain and uh, they didn't even claim the rights to it. Like for example, the zero, you know, the person who invented the zero was probably Brahmagupta, but he didn't sign it and say, you know, anybody who uses zero will have to pay me some money to put it out there in the public domain. Similarly, you guys would be rather surprised to hear you guys are uh, not far from this area called um, Irunyalakuda. And in the 13th to 15th centuries, there was a, an impressive school of mathematics and astronomy. And I'd like you to go take a look at this. It was called the Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics. There, was a, uh, there were several uh, great mathematicians there, the Mathava, Parameshwara, etc. And these guys, st staggering, staggeringly enough, actually invented most of um, calculus, although we give credit to Newton and, uh, and uh, Leibniz or Leibniz for having invented the calculus. Almost the vast majority of that invention was done by the Kerala School of Mathematics and we don't even give much credit to them. That's a little unfortunate, but what I'm trying to say is that, you know, IPR can be done by looking at the public good as well as by looking at monopolies that enable an individual or a company to make money okay there are some limitations and i want to be very clear about that most intellectual property is specific to a country so if you get a patent in india that has nothing to do with that same thing being patented elsewhere and a clever guy or a clever company can take your idea and go to the us and patent it there right so you have to be careful about that and if you have ipr and you think it's going to be interesting across the world, you might want to uh, uh, you might want to assert your IPR rights across multiple countries. There is one uh, mechanism that enables you to do that relatively easily in certain countries, you know, the most important countries like the European Union, the US, and uh, uh, China, and so forth. The Patent Cooperation Treaty enables you to file in multiple countries, because otherwise it's a huge pain. You have to go go to file in China in Chinese, maybe, etc. Another thing is that we have an enormous amount of traditional knowledge, especially in Kerala. So, for example, again, if you look at something that um, we have developed here, there was the fabulous 20-volume book called Hortus Malabaricus. It was written around 1500 in Latin by a few uh, Keralite uh, uh, Vaidyas and a few Konkani Vaidyas, and it was a compendium of all the medicinal plants of uh, the Western Ghats. And this is a fantastic document that uh, was published again in the last uh, couple of years or maybe 10 years by Kerala University. Unfortunately, that traditional knowledge is something that we cannot assert rights on by saying, look, we invented it, so you got to give us royalties. However, you can prevent other people from asserting knowledge rights on our traditional knowledge. So for example, I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, there was this issue where somebody in the US patented haldi, uh, that is uh, uh, that is turmeric, right? And said, hey, this has uh, got properties in terms of uh, antibiotic and uh, hygiene and so forth, the benefits. But then we were able to use the Horus Malabaricus to violate or to, to negate that by saying, look, you cannot patent this. This is not this that you already had. Anyway, that's, that's uh, an interesting topic and I don't have time to go into that. Um, there are some countries, notably China, and maybe to some extent other East Asian countries that use intellectual property as a weapon. And so do some companies, you know, they just pile up uh, patent rights as a bargaining chip with other uh, companies. And the final thing is that even if you have intellectual property that can be forcibly licensed, forcibly licensed in emergency situations. Okay, so these are some of the limitations of IPR. Just to give you some terms, WIPO I already talked about, WTO and WIPO are both you know, in, uh, inherently quite closely related. And TRIPS, as has been mentioned already, trade related IPR agreements is a part of WTO. If a country joins WTO, 
then they are under the TRIPS paradigm, which is quite interesting. And I'll tell you what that means in India's case. You know, earlier, India did not use to recognize process patterns. It only used to recognize product patterns. So if somebody came up with a new way of making something, say drugs, India would accept that. But under TRIPS, we stopped being able to do that. And the result has been that the price of drugs in India has gone up by probably a hundred times. Because I remember when I was a kid, you could buy, I don't know, 10 antibiotics for a rupee, right? And now each antibiotic will cost you, I don't know, 10 rupees or 50 rupees, something like that. But also that means that we're in the TRIPS uh, regime and under the TRIPS uh, agreements, which also give us some benefits. We are not outside the WTO and we can use their uh, mechanisms to help us litigate and uh, settle disputes. So TRIPS is something that we're a member of, or rather we're uh, working under TRIPS. There have been some discussions about doing something called TRIPS Plus, whereby you add some things on top of it, and India has very uh, insistently said, no, we're only going to stay with TRIPS. We don't want to pile on additional restrictions on top of that. Uh, this is something the Americans were really pushing on us, for example, when we were doing the IBR policy, they wanted us to go to TRIPS Plus, as they call it. Now, who is the person who manages all that in India? The individual is the Control General of Patents, Designs and Trademarks, which is under the uh, Department of Industrial Promotion and Policy under the Ministry of Commerce. They have this official site, india.nic.in. I welcome you to go take a look at it. As far as Kerala is concerned, there is a patent information center here, which also is eager and willing. This is Trivandrum. They're willing to uh, help you out in terms of your ability to take your idea from just an idea all the way to a, a grant of patent. There's also the NIPO, which is an Indian IPR foundation. It's a, it's a private sector entity, but uh, quite good. And I've actually uh, taken a presentation that they did, and I have used it in, in my presentation. Okay, so this is a presentation I took from NIPO. And, uh, and what, what you should note here is also, this is the, this presentation, of course, is the intellectual property of uh, James and Nicole. But if you put it out there in the public domain and say, anybody can look at it, you're not asserting your copyright. You're saying that, yes, it's mine, but feel free to use it. So a lot of people do that now. There is an idea called copyleft, where you're allowed to take uh, somebody else's uh, copyrighted material and use it, but giving, you know, uh, full, uh, you know, credit to that uh, entity that initially created the idea. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm giving full credit to James and National Intellectual Property Organization by when you use the materials. This is a presentation that I usually give my IAMB students. And that uh, is generally a 90 minute presentation. So I got to kind of reduce the content here and go through it a little bit quickly. I hope you guys will forgive me for doing that. By the way, am I going too fast, guys, or is this okay? Uh, just a quick uh, response. Are you able to follow or should I speed up, slow down? Uh, anu, any thoughts? I couldn't hear that. Yeah. Are you okay, Anu? Are you okay? Yes, sir. All right, then. Yeah, perfectly okay, then I'll continue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, then I'll continue. I was afraid I might be going too fast, but anyway. Um, yeah, so this is what we'll do here, and we already talked about the rationale and different kinds of IPRs. And the, uh, the other topic that we'll talk about uh, later on is how to license your IPR and, and uh, you know, benefit from it monetarily. Okay. All right, so here is a quick introduction, a little bit more detailed introduction to IP from WIPO, and I'm not going to go read through it. It's, uh, you, know, you guys just quickly read it and we'll just move on, okay? Basically, anything that is a creation of the human mind is an intellectual property and you can assert your rights to many of it. Okay, uh, this is already mentioned by Professor Joseph. There are a number of international treaties and as we discussed, you know, TRIPS is something that came up in the WTO era uh, not too long ago. Okay? And there are new things that are coming up. There's one on the rights of handicapped people, for example, and there are several others in the works. So the, 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 there's also, I touched on briefly, the state and the creator are, are both parties and you are balancing the rights of the creator 
and uh, the public interest by giving them exclusive rights for some number of years and then the rights revert back to the public domain okay so now we'll just go through this list as i mentioned copyright is inherent all the others you have to assert patents um, and uh, patents are obvious. I think most of you understand what patents are. Industrial designs, we'll talk about in a little bit of detail. Trademarks, also you've seen lots of trademarks, right? You've seen registered trademarks. You have the R with a little circle around it or uh, TM, right, with a circle around it. Geographical indications was also mentioned by Professor Joseph. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. To, I also was going to mention Aramula Karnadi, but there's a whole lot of these things, you know, there's a certain black rice from Mizoram, and there is a uh, there is the Kolhapuri chapel, and all sorts of things, and that's an important way of asserting your traditional uh, products. Then integrated circuits, as you know, chip design is an important activity these days, and we have mechanisms for for protecting your uh, chip designs. Trade secrets, I'll spend a little time on later. And finally, last but not least, the you you cannot actually um, assert an IPR to an existing biological thing. Like, for example, you cannot say, okay, I'm going to patent myself or my child or something like that. Those things you cannot assert. But if you create a new plant okay, by grafting or breeding or something, you will be able to assert some rights to that. This is something that's important for an agricultural agrarian country such as ourselves. And you know that there are a number of new, for example, varieties of rice that have come up, and those have uh, uh, some uh, intellectual property associated. Okay, so a bunch of uh, laws that have been created, and I want to make a distinction between the laws and the policy. The policy that we laid out is a guideline. Okay, it says here is how you should proceed, but the way those guidelines become law is when governments pass these, and there are additional laws. That are, you know, that have been, you know, I, I haven't updated this. Uh, additional laws have been passed and uh, uh, they've been put into effect. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into copyrights first. Copyrights are for uh, original literary, dramatic, or musical, or artistic works. Like I said, anything that is creative rather than intellectual in some sense, right? Uh, these are uh, things that you write or perform. You know, a music performance can be copyrighted, uh, a piece of music can be copyrighted, films can be copyrighted, etc. Okay? So there's no formality, as I said, it's there. It is already available to you, but you can actually go ahead and register it if you wish, if you want to, you know, doubly protect your intellectual property, right? But it is, uh, uh, yeah, it is, it is inherent. Okay, 60 years after you produce this music or uh, novel or whatever, you have uh, uh, copyright available to you, okay? So it's a very long time. And um, of course, this means that things that are older than 60 years are in the public domain. If there are books that were written 60 years ago, you can freely use it. Whereas if it's stuff that's written now. So incidentally, when, uh, when we were doing this uh, uh, IPR, uh, policy, we had some representation from Bollywood people, we have people from the film industry, and they came and complained about how they were not getting the rights to their uh, IPR. Like, for example, if let's say you're, I don't know, uh, Asha Bonsle, and somebody plays your music in a baby, okay, in some place where you're taking money from them to be there, then you're supposed to give Asha Bonsle a, a copyright fee. If you're doing it free of charge, like for example, it's at somebody's wedding or it's in your home or something that I pay, but if it's in a commercial setup, you're supposed to pay and they were complaining that there's a very poor um, mechanism of implementing that and they're not getting their uh, copyright payments. Okay. So moving on to patents, right? A patent is for something that is a new mechanism that you have invented, right? And uh, You've all heard of uh, people like Edison, and uh, you know you've heard of I don't know maybe Elon Musk or lots of other people who have invented things. And in India, you've got um, you know uh, J. C. Bose who invented a mechanism for uh, uh, for um, microwave or, or wireless transmission of, uh, 
of uh, data, which in fact is the fundamental intellectual property in all mobile communications now. But where, very interestingly, JC Bose refused to uh, capture IPR, but he said, look, I don't believe in individuals having patents uh, you know, uh, granted to them, so I'm going to just put it out there in the public domain. And there's another fellow named Guglielmo Marconi. The, the word named Marconi is known to you, right? So he, in fact, took JC Bose's work and patented it, and he made a lot of money out of it. So uh, uh, and patents have a limited life of 20 years. At the end of that time, your patent is no longer protected, and that's an important thing to note. So within those 20 years, you have to monetize it as much as you can, okay? And why is this being done? Because the government feels that the, uh, the value of that um, intellectual property in the past should be made available to society at large at the end of 20 years. And in fact, the moment the patent is granted, you can see it, you can see what the idea is, but you're not allowed to go in and infringe on it. If you do infringe on it, they can sue you and they'll probably win. Okay? There are three important criteria for patents, and this is global, okay? The first is that it must be novel. It must be new. It cannot be something that already exists. You have to have created a new mechanism of something, okay? Secondly, it should not be obvious to somebody who's an expert in that field. You know, suppose you're inventing something in, uh, I don't know, the automobile sector. Some expert engineer in that sector shouldn't be able to look at it and say, this is obvious. I mean, anybody could have come up with this, okay? But that's a criteria. It's a little bit uh, subjective, but that's an important criteria. And it should not be obvious to an expert in the field. And the third is that it must be useful. You know, if you create something that's new and not obvious, but it's useless, then you normally will not get a patent granted to you. But I should tell you, I've looked at old patents. There are some strange patents that don't have any utility, but they have been uh, granted. So maybe, you know, some, sometimes the patent office doesn't pay full attention to number three. In this. But these are the criteria for patenting something. Okay, so I, I already mentioned that. I won't go into it in more detail. But uh, notice that it's the National Patent Office that does this. Okay, and it's only valid in the country where it's patented. So, and clearly foreigners can apply for patents. In fact, in India's case, something like 70% of the patents that are being granted in India are granted to companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and, and so forth, which uh, take and General Electric that take uh, patenting very seriously. Okay. There are a number of things that are not patentable. Okay. But I, I'm not going to go through all of them, one or two. Something that's frivolous, like for example, a perpetual motion machine, we all know is a physical impossibility. So if you, if you invent a perpetual motion machine, they're gonna laugh at you and tell you to go away, okay? The algorithms cannot be patented, which immediately also means computer programs cannot be patented. There is a way around this, there is a hack, if you will, which is that if you write a computer program and then you make that program do something physically, right? Like it moves a lever or it prints an output or shows something on the screen. That computer program along with that mechanical thing can in fact be patented. And that's the way people uh, often you know, subvert that uh, uh, objection. In India, it's called uh, section 3K, which says that no computer program or algorithm can be, uh, can be uh, uh, patented. Okay, you can copyright it. You know, the moment you write a computer program, it's copyrighted, which means that nobody can just take that program and copy it word for word. Of course, a clever programmer can go ahead and kind of, you know, uh, do the same thing in a, a somewhat different way, and that may not violate your copyright, okay? So there's a bunch of things that are not patentable. So for example, things that actually cause harm. So for example, a, a nuclear weapon, you, you cannot patent it. The patent office will let you have that, et cetera. Okay, the traditional knowledge, as I already mentioned, is not uh, patentable. Atomic energy is not patentable, right? So if you want to read up on patents, there's an enormous amount of material out there, so just to go and look it up. But let me conclude by saying that patents are perhaps the most important IPR that you think about when you, uh, when you first think about IPR. 
And uh, there are many countries and many companies that spend an enormous amount of money and time and effort in getting patent rights. And uh, if you have a technical idea, the most obvious thing for you to do would be to see if you can patent it. And it's not a trivial process. There are some steps associated with it. Still, you can patent, write the patent application yourself. You don't need to go to a lawyer necessarily, uh, but you can, for example, contact the PIC that I mentioned, Patent Information Center with Alma Kerala, or the, uh, uh, the national uh, website that I mentioned to you. And even you can go to WIPO. You know, WIPO has a whole bunch of material there, okay? Next, different topic is industrial designs. What are industrial designs? It is the look and feel of something that may make it quite unique, okay? So the, the shape, the contours, right? The processes, etc. cetera, the, the look and feel of something. And some examples in consumer products, right? These are all designs that somebody made, right? These are not, you know, natural things. They didn't come out of nature. So somebody invented the design of the toothpaste. There's a company called IDEO, a famous company in Silicon Valley. They have invented, for example, the computer mouse that Apple used and, uh, you know, all sorts of other things. If you go to a petrol pump and you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, petrol dispensing machine, normally they're boxy, but some petrol pumps have this Z-shaped uh, dispenser that was designed by the National Institute of Design. And the IIT Bombay design cell is also very good. So there is a whole profession of designers who make these things in consumer products or in pharmaceutical products and in all kinds of other things, including, I don't know, the chair you're sitting on was designed by somebody, the, the pen you use, this computer screen that you're looking at, it's all designed by somebody. And those designs can be granted recognition so that another person cannot uh, infringe on it, okay? So you have to apply for it and uh, you only have, you know, 10 plus five, 15 years of uh, protection on the design. Trademarks, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with. An example is this Woolmart trademark. You know, this is, uh, you, you've seen this for uh, genuine wool, right? And then uh, you have signs and letters, numbers, all sorts of things that encapsulate a, a trademark. And uh, yeah, again, trademarks are only valid in this country, which leads to the interesting um, idea that let's say you have, I don't know, some famous uh, brand in India, let's say, uh, let's pick, uh, pick something that's very famous. That's, uh, let's say, prestige, okay? Prestige pressure cookers or something. You can go and register the trademark in another country. And prestige in India, if it didn't take the trouble to, to register the trademark in that other country, they have no say. That person can then um, create some things that are, you know, in the prestige name and you have no recourse. I've also seen very interesting uh, things done um, by counterfeiters, okay? You may have heard, uh, uh, you, you may have seen electronics made by a company called Sharp, you know, S-H-A-R-P, the Japanese company. Once I was running around in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is a, uh, is a center for counterfeit stuff. You know, like if you walk around, they, somebody will come to you and say, copy watch, copy watch, right? What does it mean that you be counterfeit watches? Um, and in fact, I bought a counterfeit watch like this. It's, it's a Rolex counterfeit, right? A Rolex is a very expensive watch. I got mine for ten dollars, and it wasn't bad. It looked quite nice, and of course, it was a, you know, it was a uh, obviously a uh, fake, and it cost me ten dollars as opposed to you know two thousand dollars for Rolex, and you know this this happens. But uh, I also found that in one of these uh, markets, night markets, I forget where it was, probably in Taipei or something. I found a calculator that looked exactly like a sharp calculator, except it wasn't actually sharp. It was shrap. Okay, they wrote it in the same font, but we just you know interchange the H and the R. So that means they're avoiding the trademark infringement. They didn't, in fact, infringe the sharp trademark. But you know, uh, a law, I mean, a lawsuit might say that they're you know subtly violating it. Okay. Anyway, so that's uh, about trademarks. There are various kinds of them, service marks as well. Okay. And again, you have to assert it in your country. So Coca-Cola is a well-known trademark. Toblerone, this uh, Swiss brand of chocolate, they make this triangular one that is both a design, right? The design of the triangle is a design pattern. Plus, they have this trademark uh, on, on that area, as you can see. The GE uh, logo is a trademark, etc. Okay. Uh, geographical indications, as we... Um, 
mentioned briefly, these could be mostly agricultural goods. So for example, some of the, uh, uh, some of you guys would have seen champagne, right? Champagne is basically um, a kind of alcohol, right? It's, you know, it's, it's basically uh, um, wine with a, a certain process. Now, champagne is a part of France and this, this kind of um, aerated wine can only be called champagne if it comes from there. You can make the exact same thing in India. You cannot call it champagne. You have to call it, I don't know, aerated wine or something. Similarly, whiskey. I'm sure some of your young people there are fans of Scotch whiskey, but you can only call it Scotch if you make it in, in uh, Scotland. If you make it in India, you like to call it uh, something else. I forget what they call it. So for instance, Grover vineyards in India and other people who make Indian uh, liquor cannot call it whiskey, okay? So it doesn't even need to have a locality associated with it. Alfonso, you know, is a brand in the Basmati. Uh, and to violate the Basmati brand in America, they grow it in Texas and they call it Texmati. In California, they call it Kalmati, okay? Which is strictly speaking, not a violation of the Basmati uh, geographic indication, but in, in reality it is. Aramula Canary was already mentioned before. And usually these geographical indications are either handicrafts or is it some kind of food stuff that's uh, uh, endemic to a particular place? And what it do, does is the GI uh, gives you the ability, those people who are traditional craftsmen in that area have a monopoly on using that name, okay? Uh, it has to be registered and again, 10 years. But this thing is forever. You can keep on registering it year after year, it doesn't expire, okay? Moving on. Integrated circuit design, and uh, again, as we discussed, uh, you know, if you come up with a particularly clever, uh, you know, IC design in India, you can go and get it registered. Unfortunately, if I'm not mistaken, we've only got like three or four of these IC designs in India in the last uh, ten years or so that this mechanism has been available. What this means is a is a sad thing for India. We're not designing integrated circuits. And that's unfortunate because as you know, ICs and semiconductors are the basis of almost all the electronics that you're seeing today. And unless India has a strong position in that, we'll continue to be dependent on other countries for uh, chips, right? So that's sad, but I hope that over time, we'll have more IC designs. Trade secrets is an interesting thing. In fact, this is something that uh, is outside the usual realm of IPR that we've talked about so far, because all of those things are registered with a government, right? Whereas a trade secret is something you keep to yourself, okay? So you don't want to let it out because the moment you patent something, that uh, the content of that patent, you can just go and read the patent so you know exactly what that invention is, although you may not be able to infringe it, okay? And 20 years later, you can, in fact, uh, use it in any way you want. But what a trade secret is, is something that's so valuable to you as a company that you keep it to yourself. You don't let it out, right? What this does is two things. On the one hand, if you're able to retain this trade secret by not telling too many people, you can maintain that trade secret for an infinite amount of time, an indefinite period of time, 10 years, 100 years, 200 years, so long as it doesn't come out, it's safe with you. But if it comes out, somehow somebody reveals it you have absolutely no protection, okay? So one example that we typically use is that Coca-Cola has a particular concoction that gives its uh, drinks a particular taste. That's a trade secret. And they have had that trade secret maintained for, I don't know, 150 years or something, because only like five people uh, in the uh, company know it. And uh, they probably pay them extremely well and threaten to beat them to death if they reveal it or whatever. But it's been maintained, but um, other things are also kept like this for a, uh, a long time, okay? All right, so that's a trade secret. And plant varieties, I mentioned to you, if you invent a new plant variety, if you're a breeder, right? And this is applied to animals, it's only for crops. And it's particularly interesting for a country like us, as I was mentioning, you know, we're still a significantly agricultural country. By the way, if you talk about India's core competence, this is something that I've discussed in, 
in many of my uh, lectures. You know, what is India's core confidence? I would say India has two things it does, or at least in its long history of 5,000 years, the two things India has done well are one is agriculture and the second is intellectual property. If you talk about agriculture, India is one of the two places in the world that rice was uh, originally uh, domesticated, right? And many animals were domesticated because uh, there is a there is uh, some controversy, but I think India can claim that um, the first variety of rice was domesticated in India about 9,000 years ago. It was a very long time ago. And that's uh, Indica, whereas Japonica was uh, 8,000 years ago or something like that. So this is in, and how do you do this? Patiently farmers breed, breed plant varieties. That's how you get it. So we need to give them protection for that, okay? Now, just moving on to the next topic. Let's say you have some IPR huh, of any of these varieties. So let me uh, reiterate what I just told you. I just talked to you about the various kinds of IPR and uh, the protections that you can get from them by registering your IPR rights. And of course, trade secrets you need to maintain by yourself and copyright is inherent to you. So that's the first uh, section of my talk, which is the different kinds of IPR. Second is, how can you monetize it? Let's assume that you have generated some IPR and how can you as a small company benefit from that, okay? So you license the IPR. If you have a patent, you can negotiate a licensing term with somebody. And, it, and usually what you do is, you give it to them for a short period of time, three years, or you give it to them for just this geography. Okay, I'm gonna license my patent to you for use in Southern India, but I'm gonna give this license to somebody else for Western India or for the United States, I'm gonna give you this license. So you give non-exclusive licenses to people, right? And you negotiate an amount because the entity that's licensing it obviously sees some value in it and they will pay you for it. An example of this is, I don't know, I don't have time to go into it in detail, but in, um, there are these things called uh, standards uh, essential patents. So for instance, in handsets, there are a bunch of uh, patents like that, okay? And uh, those are so essential and important for somebody to create a handset, you have no choice but to uh, pay somebody a license. So interestingly enough, all of you I'm sure have Android handsets, at least most of you. You know, uh, Android is a Google product, but if you buy an Android based handset, Google gets nothing out of it. They get no money from it, from the handset maker, but Microsoft makes $10 per handset from the handset maker. Why? Because they have licensed a bunch of their IPR to Google, which is then included inside Android, okay? So licensing can make a fair amount of money and it's a continuing income source, right? Every time your licensee utilizes the license, it embeds it in something, you make money, okay? So um, you can work out many kinds of mechanisms. You can say, okay, I'm gonna license it to you, just give me an upfront payment, okay? Or you give me 20% upfront and then for each unit you sell, give me, you know, $10 like Microsoft says, okay? Uh, so that's the way in which, you know, so I, I'm going into this in a little bit of detail because some of you may be very smart uh, uh, engineers or other technical people who can come up with a, with a patentable idea. But then, you know, you may find it difficult to bring that idea to market because you don't have the manufacturing capability. You don't have the selling capability. You don't have the brand name, right? So in that case, you're better off just assigning or license your patent to somebody who has all those. To give you an example, I have a friend who invented a new chapati making machine. Very interesting, he has two patents on it. So what it does is it takes the dough, right? it just actually doesn't, it just takes the, the, uh, the flour and water and it kneads it properly. And then it uh, has two um, uh, steel uh, plates that just come together and they squish the dough in between and produces a proper chapati. And you're very proud of it. And actually, actually it's great stuff. It, it works very well. But my question to him, to him, I'm going to ask a question to you guys who are all thinking of becoming entrepreneurs. Okay, now how are you going to manufacture this? Do you know manufacturing? No, you're a, you're a technical guy. So why don't you stop at the IPR that you've created, 
sell it through licensing to somebody else, let it become their problem to manufacture, certify it, okay, and then go to market with it under their brand name, right? So one business model, and I want to emphasize this, that business models are very important. If you are really good at coming up with ideas, one thing you could look at and uh, seriously think of is, why don't I just keep on coming up with ideas? I create an idea, create a patent, and I license the patent to somebody, and I'll get some money from them on an ongoing basis, and I go off and create my next patent, right? Instead of trying to actually make that box, whatever it is, and try and sell it and brand it and so forth, okay? So is licensing uh, something that makes some money? Yeah, this, this information is a little bit old. I'm sure if I update it for 2020, I'll be able to, I know, for example, my, my own university, Stanford, has made like a billion dollars in uh, licensing fees. So for example, even Google's original patents are Stanford's patents. So you can imagine how much that's paid out for Stanford, right? So there's an enormous amount of money, even in India, the CSIR makes a lot of money from that. Okay, so this is the second topic I wanted to mention to you. You know, how do you make money off of the intellectual property that you have created? Okay, patents is what I've, well, I've touched upon now. Similarly, if it's uh, copyrights as well, but as I said, you know, the, the enforcement of copyright uh, uh, payments is not all that great in India. Uh, so, may I have a more difficult view. But think of if your competence is as a creator of intellectual property, but not as somebody who manufactures and uh, distributes things, and you don't have a brand, you may want to consider this mechanism of licensing your uh, intellectual property. Okay? Now, India specific stuff. Okay, as was mentioned, uh, we wrote this IPR policy, and yes, uh, I was one of the people who wrote it. Although it is interesting, it was me and five lawyers, right? And um, so I think they brought me in as a technical guy so that I could talk about some of the technical issues. Now, we wrote this policy with the best of intentions. We said, for example, you know, it was spread all over the place, like uh, copyrights were under the Ministry of Human Resources, and patents were under the you know, Ministry of Commerce, we put everything together in one place, and that has happened. And we suggested some incentives so that even small guys, because many small guys feel the whole process of creating a patent is very expensive and complicated, so they don't do it. So we tried to provide some mechanisms to support the small guys by saying, for example, you know, the first patent that a small company has should be free. And in fact, lawyers should be willing to give their uh, support for that creation also for free, not only with the government not charge you anything, but uh, you know the lawyer won't charge you anything either. But also traditional knowledge systems, which we think are severely under uh, under uh, appreciated, you know, we should support them. Uh, petty patents we won't talk about. Yeah, and the U.S. was pushing us on trips plus, and we said no, we're not going to do that. There are two provisions in India's laws that are quite interesting. Okay, one is called 3D, and the other is called 3K. So let me touch upon 3K first. That is about software patents, it explicitly says you cannot patent software in India. And I think that's a very sensible thing to do. Because the US at some point started providing software patents and we get a huge mess by the time we get out of it. Now to 3D. What 3D says is it's specific to pharmaceuticals, right? You may be aware that India is a huge manufacturer of uh, generic drugs, right? And this is somehow related, somewhat related to that. Um, because drug patents, like every other patent, runs out after 20 years, right? So let's say you're Glaxo, you know, you're a big foreign company that has uh, a drug patent and you make money for 20 years. And then what you typically try to do is to make a minor improvement to it, okay? And then say, hey, this is a new patent, okay? So give me another 20 years. For that okay that's called evergreening and in the west partly because these companies are western companies you know they are much more likely to allow you to evergreen by giving you an extension of your patent in india it's very strict unless it's a really new thing okay and you can show efficacy you will not it has to be really novel it will not be allowed to be uh, evergreen and there's a huge uh, uh, hue and cry about it from the big pharma companies, but people who are advocates for patients and for all of us, that is, um, say Medecins Sans Frontier, these are the guys who are uh, doctors of the frontiers 
those people, in fact, when we were writing the policy, both Medicines on Frontier and MNC pharma companies came to us. MNC said, why don't you kill off 3D? And Medicines on Frontier said, absolutely don't kill off you know, 3D. So we had you know, two completely opposing points of view presented to us. So this also leads, uh, it's, it's not the same thing, but there is also another uh, area, which is the compulsory licensing of drugs when um, there is reason. So for example, today, let's say there is a new drug for COVID, right? And uh, uh, the government decides that, uh, okay, somebody like uh, Gilead Sciences has a patent on it, but you can violate that patent and say, look, this is not being made available to our people, okay? And there was a case called Bay and Matco, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. This is a major case in India where one of Bayer's uh, um, drugs was compulsorily licensed to Matco because Bayer was not making it available um, and affordable to people. Mm -hmm. yeah, and one other uh, point that I wanted to make about uh, entrepreneurs is uh, you may have a brilliant patent. I mean, it may be really, really good, but that's no success uh, guarantor, okay? And I say this because I've had, uh, you know, direct uh, experiences. This guy is a Malayali guy named Saji Mulakan. Uh, he used to be my neighbor when I was living in California, and he invented a new engine for cars, okay? Which is more fuel efficient. And he was like, whoa, I'm not gonna be rich. He went and patented it in the US, Japan, European Union, uh, not China, but this is like you know, 30 years ago. And he spent $150,000 on all the patenting. And then he thought, okay, all these companies are gonna come running to my doorstep and I'll make big money. But unfortunately for him, nobody came, okay? And there are a variety of reasons for that, but I won't go into it. But so therefore what happened to Kursaji is that he lost $150,000. Another example, again, from the automobile market was Eli O. This is, a, this is a case, it's a Harvard Business School case that I teach in the IAMs. Somebody came with a really advanced uh, car seat, uh, which had lots of you know, safety properties and stuff like that. But he also had a very hard time convincing the car companies to take it. So in fact, he didn't succeed in the long run. Having said that, it's still not a bad idea to have some patent or other IPR because anybody who looks at your startup company will value it higher, okay? And you will have some protection if you have some IPR. There's also a very strange thing, not, not so strange, but a very unethical thing that large companies do. And uh, this is, they may come and say to you, hey, I like your, uh, I like your uh, new thing, whatever you're doing, right? Let's say you're building a, a new, I don't know, device. We like you, we want to invest in you. Okay, and they start talking to you and you're so eager to bring them on board. You tell them everything. And then they say, thank you very much. Uh, we're not interested in investing in you anymore. Or they may even invest in you, right? But they, uh, but they basically are looking to steal your IPR. Microsoft was infamous for this. They used to enter into negotiations with lots of small companies with the sole purpose of reverse engineering it, whatever the small company had. And then they say, thank you very much. We don't want to work with you anymore. Goodbye. Amazon does this. Amazon has been uh, on the radar recently. Lots of people have complained that Amazon at least invests in companies and then kills them off and steals their IPO. So entrepreneurs have to be a little bit you know, really careful about it. Even if you have some wonderful IPR, how do you make uh, a success out of it? Okay. Now the NATCO Bayer license that I mentioned where Bayer's uh, compulsory license happened was done by a Malayali guy and a friend of mine actually gentleman named P.H. Kurian. I don't know if you remember him. He was uh, a secretary in the government. I think he probably was chief secretary and he was uh, uh, he retired maybe three, four years ago. He did a brilliant thing. So I have a, another slide on that. Novartis and Glivec. Novartis was a company that was trying to evergreen one of, it's a pharma company again, one of its, um, one of its uh, uh, products. And it was having a, a huge fight with an Indian company called Glivec which had been its licensee, and uh, uh, Novartis was trying to evergreen the product okay, using the this, this Section 3D. And the lawyer who argued for uh, uh, Glivec is a friend of mine named uh, Pratipa Singh. She's now a, uh, a Delhi High Court Justice. So she won the case for Glivec, and so no, no, Novartis was unable to, uh, to, um, 
uh, to take advantage of that uh, uh, mild improvement they made. Another very interesting story is uh, CIPLA. CIPLA had, or maybe he's still there, a CEO named Hamid. And uh, when large companies were charging an enormous amount for AIDS drugs, a cocktail, a mix of you know, AIDS drugs, CIPLA said, hey, we'll give that. I mean, they were charging something like, I don't know, $10,000 a year. So CIPLA said, we're going to do the same thing. We'll offer it to you for $1 a day, which is $365 a year, which is a lot lower than $10,000. So they did that. They actually produced it. And then all the other big pharma companies also raised their prices to $365 a year. Another example is, I don't know if you remember the bird flu epidemic a few years ago. Thailand said, look, uh, we're, there is this drug called Tamiflu, and this is an emergency for us. And so we're going to explicitly break your license in Thailand. And we're going to allow Thai companies to produce Thai flu, I mean Tamiflu. And that's something that India, uh, again, going back to the Korean story, India is entirely within its rights to do that. In the COVID case, you know, there are some, um, uh, I don't know, allegations that uh, the virus is actually an invented virus, that uh, the uh, virology lab in Wuhan may have had uh, an, a bio warfare experiment that created this virus and then it got loose. We don't know the truth of that, but it's, it's an interesting and not entirely impossible uh, scenario that it was a bioweapon. But more interesting from our point of view is you may have heard of this thing called HCQ, hydroxychloroquine. And uh, according to um, Indian doctors, and I have close friends who are doctors who are utilizing this in their practices for people who are early stage uh, uh, coronavirus patients, they're finding HCQ is extremely useful. But the caveat is you got to give it to them at an early stage in the first five days of them showing any symptoms. If you give it to them late, it won't work. Remdesivir, on the other hand, is a brand new antiviral drug that a company called Gilead Sciences in California has come out with. Now, Remdesivir, if I remember correctly, um, it costs, it would cost you 30,000 rupees for a course of treatment. HCQ, one pill costs six rupees. And so for a total of about maybe 250 rupees, you can have your complete course of HCQ uh, uh, treatment. Now, HCQ is not a patented. Hydroxychloroquine is not patented. So nobody's going to make any money out of it. Whereas Remdesivir is patented. And therefore, the pharma companies are interested in that. So this is a, an example of the tussle that goes around you know, in terms of how can people who hold IPR make money off of them. In my opinion, my sympathies are fully with HCQ because that's cheap, it's available, it's around for a long time. And, uh, you know, just give it and see if it works, okay? All right, moving on. This is a picture I took of a page where uh, Arun Panagaria, who later became the, uh, you know, the economic advisor to the prime minister, is saying a very positive thing about Korea because it's the first time that uh, uh, multinational companies patent on a drug was uh, with very good uh, reason uh, broken by India. The, the judge in that case is also a friend of mine. She's a, a lady named Prabha Sridevan. Uh, she was on the IPR policy uh, committee. And uh, incidentally, just, just for fun, she's Vishnathan Anand, you know, the chess prodigy, his uh, chess master, his aunt. So she also mentioned to me that this is a brilliantly argued case by Kurian. Kurian is not a lawyer, I mean, he had a chemistry background, but uh, he was an IAS officer and he did a, a brilliant job. So, you know, there are, and I, I like to uh, read what this says, uh, what uh, Anavan Panagari has said. It is said that only God and a few good men and women run India. One such man is Kurian. Kurian, great guy, you know, as the control general of patents, designs, and trademarks. He, uh, he did this, okay? So now I've given you an enormous amount of material. I'm gonna run about two or three minutes late, uh, if you will allow me that. Where can you find more? Just go to WIPO, okay? This is a screenshot of the WIPO page and they got a ton of these seminars, okay? Webinars that you can uh, download. They also used to have paid uh, 
uh, uh, courses, but now because of the uh, the uh, coronavirus situation, they're offering this for free. So anything that you have as a question now, just, if you're interested in this area, just go and listen to these webinars and you might even want to get a certificate from them if, uh, if you find this area of great interest, okay? Okay, so we merely, you know, this is a gigantic area, okay? There are entire, uh, in fact, there's a whole court set up in India, which is the, I, you know, it's the, it's the court for IPR and uh, it's called IPAB, Intellectual Property uh, Appellate Board, it's in Chennai. Okay, and there are hundreds of lawyers who specialize in this. In fact, it's a, a growing specialization. So, you know, in the last, I don't know, 45 minutes or something, I've only been able to give you an extremely superficial view into it. It takes a lot of money, but it actually can work and uh, people take it very seriously because this, there is a enormous benefit to those who win uh, patent battles. Okay, so let me reiterate what I wanted you to take away from this. One, that there are many kinds of IPR. Second, that if you have uh, the ability to come up with an original idea and you're able to generate an IPR out of that, you should be able to find a business model which is most appropriate for you. And I would suggest that uh, licensing is a good model to look at. And thirdly, there are many things that um, uh, happen in India and around the world that are closely related to IPR that if you're interested in, you should you know, pay attention to what WIPO does and go listen to some of the seminars and you'll find them quite interesting. So I will stop here and Anu as the keeper of the event, I've only taken two minutes more than what is allocated to me, so don't, um, yeah, so I'm a good, I'm a good person, aren't I? So I'll stop now and close my uh, screen. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, a very enlightening and uh, comprehensive session indeed. I hope we can take a few questions now. Is that okay? I'll be, I'll be happy to. Uh, I think there are already some questions in the chat box. Uh, shall I read them to you, sir? Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, this is from Ms. Uh, Jinda Thomas. Uh, she asked, how are the conflicts between IPR laws within two countries solved? Okay, so um, if there is a serious issue, and usually um, most of the basic IPR laws follow a pattern. So there isn't that much by way of conflict between two countries, okay? In fact, what's happened is that the most advanced countries in IPR laws typically have been the US and uh, Western Europe, and to some extent, Japan. So what other countries have done is to take those laws as the basis of their uh, IPR legislation, okay? So there is a great deal in common. The, what, what happens above, over and above that is that there are industrial policies that these countries pursue that may have a, uh, an impact on the way the courts adjudicate them. So if there is a major conflict there, you can go to either the, WTO, because the WTO has a resolution, so a conflict resolution mechanism, right? You can bring it up there, or you might be able to bring in the WIPO guys as an arbitrator. That'll be an easier mechanism. The WTO conflict resolution mechanism is kind of heavy and it takes years. So there are some mechanisms to, to uh, bring them uh, in some sync. But in reality, the laws are usually roughly the same. It's the interpretations, like I mentioned about the uh, the way the Americans will give you uh, evergreening of drugs, whereas the Indian law doesn't allow you to do that. Those are the things that we need to come. Hello. Uh, oh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Yes, Nahas, sir. Go ahead. Oh, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Sir, my question regarding uh, the IPAB. Uh, yeah. I, uh, what is the, uh, 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 is it a court or how it functions, sir? It's a court. It's run by a person who is the equivalent of a high court judge. Okay. okay so it's okay. a proper court and it only hears IP related cases. And there are plenty of them. Like I mentioned, the ones that, uh, you know, the Novartis uh, case or the Bayer case, those are pure IP cases that they may be adjudicated by a normal court, right? Some 
you know, court, let's say in Canada or, or, uh, or I mean, high court may adjudicate it. And if it then gets appealed, the appeal goes to IPD. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Okay, participants, if you have any questions, you can type the questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask him the questions. Uh, there's one more question Hello? posted uh, in the uh, chat box by Mr. Mulligan. He goes, okay. um, um, so what about KFC? Is this what about who? Uh, I couldn't hear that. I lost you there. I couldn't hear it. What about KFC? Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, KFC. Yeah. KFC. What is KFC? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. What is KFC? Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, what about I it? I guess. Uh, is this a good example of uh, GI? Ah, okay. Uh, no, no. It's just, uh, it's simply a, uh, uh, a brand. Oh. It's just a brand. Okay. It's not a GI that's been registered as a geographic indicator. It's it's like saying, you know, I mean, to give you another example, Guru Vayur Papadam, right? It's not reached a point where it's a GI. If you apply for it, maybe you'll get it, but at the moment, it's just a brand. Well, good afternoon, sir. My, I'm Felix from Chennai. My yeah. point is this day, for, for my, for my admission, if I design some curriculum for a short period, you no. Know? Uh, for a semester of three credits or four credits, can I do that? For like, can I protect that one exclusively? Because I do adventure sports along with that, the outbound learning kind. If I design something of my own, a different kind, this one, can I protect that? Well, I mean, it is inherently copyrighted. Okay, whatever mm -hmm. you are uh, creating is your copyright. But there are some exceptions. Okay, so you you might want to look at the exceptions carefully. I don't remember whether there is an exception to your copyright if you're a teacher who uh, teaches that the copyright may no longer sit with you it may be see as a teacher you have in a way created that ipr while you are being paid by that company by the university right okay mm -hmm. now i'm making an analogy with for example when i was working in silicon valley each of us had to sign an agreement with the company that while we were employed, whatever intellectual property we created belonged to the company if we used company facilities or company time or company equipment. Okay, that is a contract we have to sign. So my belief is that if you created your material using or the university can prove that you used university resources, in creating that copyrighted material, the copyright uh, would not be yours. It would become public domain. But I will not agree yeah. with you. One point we used it. That's one yeah. part. If we are not used it, because I do an outdoor bond, which is nothing related to that, in case that I take it up, can be used. See, if you not use any kind of uh, facilities from the respective institutions, or yeah, it would be, be hard for you to prove that. Okay. So typically, if you start a company in the US, okay, and you have an intellectual property uh, that you believe is important, what they say is quit your job, okay, then start working on your IPR. Whatever is in your head, nobody can claim. But if you're still working in that company, they can tie you up in knots by saying, oh, see, you, you know, use my phone or whatever, right? So the safe thing to do is to assume the worst case that the university can make a claim. So I would not do it. So ideally, what I would suggest to you is if you're, you mentioned adventure sports, is there a person who is a friend of yours who's running an adventure shop, adventure sports thing, make him do it so that, you know, he has no affiliation with the university. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sure. Hello, sir. Can you hear yeah. me? A.B. Alex William, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm a faculty member of St. Louis College of Applied Sciences. Hi. Uh, I have uh, two questions for you. One is, uh, what are the kind of production that IPR gives to discoveries? I'm not talking about inventions, to discoveries. None. None. So no. uh, I have 
uh, some time back i've heard that people could get uh, ipr against certain uh, variety of herbal plants or medicinal plants found indigenous to our uh, kerala or some place in, in india is that possible no no you cannot uh, first of all patent any uh, biological things okay that's a, that's a given right because these are these are aspects of nature you won't be able to get a patent on it you might be able to to some extent um, claim something under the uh, the farmers act you know the part, the part that i was talking about but that's usually for things that you have bred if you breed something new right and you generate a new intellectual property uh, a new crop or or maybe you breed a new you know um, a new uh, rose let's say or a new variety of rice okay because you can prove that this didn't exist in nature before and you were the person who invented it so discoveries do not i mean basically no discovery comes under an ipr okay it's like saying no discoveries no discoveries it's like saying hey i discovered uh, that the earth uh, you know rotates around the sun do i get a patent on that no you know anything in nature is not uh, patentable okay thank you sir sure. uh there's a question from sneha kamish uh, it says uh, sir uh, nirmala sitaraman once said that over 230000 patent applications were pending in the indian patent offices how long will it take to grant the patent and why does it take such a long period okay the normal time frame that it takes for a patent to be granted even in the us which is pretty efficient is about 3 years okay and the reason is that um you know when this patent application comes to you first of all um i didn't mention this but writing a patent application is a very very uh painful detailed and uh, strange task because the way you write a patent application is not really english it's this bizarre kind of lingo right the first time you read a patent you're like what is this you won't even understand the diagrams look so weird things like that and then you have this thing called you know independent claims and you got dependent claims right so it takes a huge amount of effort to actually write a patent i would suggest to you and there are patents available on the net you can go find them you know ibm has a repository the us patent office has a repository the indian patent office has a repository you just go read some patents and and your head will spin when you read them okay so it's a very technically written thing now why does it take so long because the um, patent office people may not be experts in the specific domain that this patent applies to right so they have to first of all read and understand the claims that are being made second they have to bring in some domain experts okay and so there is a lot of back and forth and then you may go back to the inventor and say hey you know this thing that you claim is not clear or this thing that you claimed is impossible because it's already been granted to somebody else okay so there is a back and forth and you may end up um in fact uh dropping some of your claims okay or modifying them so there's a lot of back and forth now that is one aspect so inherently the patent office is one that takes time to give you something because if you give a patent too easily people will start gaming you and then they'll start bringing you know strange stuff and then you'll have to go through this invalidation process and it's it's a, it's a huge issue I, i don't know if anybody here is familiar with the term crispr cas9 anish i know you're waiting to finish this off but let me you know finish off my uh, uh, my answers here um crispr i don't know if anybody's heard of crispr that's a new thing for gene editing and massive patent battles have been going on in that uh, area this on the one hand you got people from the university of california berkeley and the other hand you got people from uh, harvard university and mit and they're all fighting for this patent to be granted them because a, there is a definite nobel prize for the person who wins that patent and then lots of money to be made as well so and uh, therefore the patent that is being granted will be scrutinized to death right and if you make a mistake in it you're going to have a lot of problems down the road as far as the 
if you're the patent uh, uh, granting authority. So they take it very seriously to make sure that they cannot be blamed going back uh, when things come back. Now, the backlog is because we have been relatively inefficient, and that's a problem that our IPR policy was also talking about. You know, uh, what can we do to reduce the backlog? And it's not only patents, uh, even trademarks. You know, tens of thousands of trademarks are uh, backlogged, and there's no reason for it to be that bad. It's uh, bureaucratic inefficiency, unfortunately, is a problem as well. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, we should wind up the question answer session now. Okay. Uh, I now invite Assistant Professor Anish Baskarin, HOD, PG Department of Commerce, to deliver the vote of thanks. So, so before the formal vote of thanks, so, so I stand up here to salute you for the wonderful session we had. Honorable Professor Rajesh Srinivasan, sir, respected engineer Punus George, academic director, principal, other distinguished guests, dear colleagues, and participants. Good evening, all. Now we have come to the end of a fruitful session on IPR. The duty entrusted to me is to extend a lot of thanks to all the members who were part of this webinar. A big thank you to Professor Rajesh Srinivasan, sir, for accepting our invitation as a resource person for such a relevant area. I am 100% sure that we all are benefited with key points highlighted in this session, which was followed with a great discussion. Sir, we are all inspired by your great words. On behalf of St. Gitts Group of Institution, I sincerely thank you, sir. Engineer Punus George, the executive chairman, the man behind the success of St. Gitts Group of Institutions, his vision about learning is always an inspirational thought for us. On behalf of all present here, I propose a vote of thanks to you, sir. Dr. K.K. John, our principal, always a supporting force, his encouragement, guidance for both academic and non-academic activities are highly enlightening as to do things in a right way. Thank you, sir. Professor M.C. Joseph, Academic Director, we are thankful to you, sir, for your kind presence and for the felicitation given. A special thanks to Dr. Roji George, Dean, St. Kitts Institute of Management, Mr. Anthony Joseph, General Manager, Assistant Professor Chin Mohan, and Assistant Professor Mini Kumar for their support. I extend my gratitude to all the delegates from within and outside state for the grand success of this webinar. Special mention to all HODs for their support. Assistant Professor Anu Sakriya, IQC coordinator, Assistant Professor Anu Meri, the webinar coordinator, and all the members of organizing team for their wonderful coordination of this program. Last but not least, I extend a of thanks to all teaching, non-teaching staff, and dear students for being part of this event. Thank you all once again. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you, sir. We have now come to the end of the session. Thank you all for your valuable time, especially in the participants. Please do not forget to fill in the feedback form which has been posted in the chat box. Once again, thank you on behalf of Cambridge College of Applied Sciences. We hope to see you all soon. Thank you and have a nice.